but we are really honored and blessed to have Dr. Amy Anderson here. Yay, Dr. Amy. Uh, she is going to share background on the Gospel of John. That's the book that we're going through right now. And Amy, uh, as you've heard, is really a scholar in the whole area of the New Testament uh, manuscripts. She's written several books in that area. So we're so honored to have you here. Amy, why don't you come and share? All right, uh, to, before I say anything else, I'm going to be ha asking you to look in your Bibles today. So if you don't happen to have one, there are some on the back table over there. And uh, I'm very tempted to go off on a spiel about how much better it is to have a hard copy Bible than an electronic one. S someday I'm going to do a little video on that. It's the same difference as what a GPS can tell you and what a map can tell you. They're, they're different tools, and you need, to, you, know, you need to have the hard copy for sure if you're going to have the electronic as well. And I see a lot of people sitting here who have heard me talk about the sign profit movement, so you could probably be teaching this yourself. And one other thing I just wanted to say, um, in Craig you have a gifted Bible scholar who's also a pastor and a good preacher. I land more on the teacher side of things, and you're going to see that this morning. I have 40 minutes, they told me, to teach, and they said there should be some application somewhere. And I'm like, well, information is good. Why do we need to, you know, information helps me read my Bible better. That's enough for me. But, um, but I think you will see some things, to, especially towards the end, where God challenges our hearts uh, in something. So have we got slides yet? Uh, uh, and Lou Shane, there will be one point at which I ask you to jump ahead and then come back again. I was going to warn you about that. So we know, ugh, we know about the history of the Roman Empire because of historians who wrote things. Those historians were all Romans and Greeks, right? If, um, if we wanted to know about a small conquered people, we would have more trouble finding information because the great historians of the Greeks and the Romans did not write about small conquered peoples except maybe a one-liner somewhere saying that some emperor conquered them. How do we know when the temple was completed? How do we know about the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD? The source of these materials was a man named Josephus, and he, has, he comes under a, no, a number of different names. Josephus bar Matthias means he's the son of Matthias. He's also called Flavius, if you skip to the next one. He is a Jewish historian, right? So he's interested in what happened to the Jewish people. He wrote an immense amount of material, and I was going to bring his complete works here today, and I think I've loaned it out to someone, and I don't remember who, so that happens to me way too much. Um, but because of his importance as a historian, first I want to go quickly over his own history and the, the writings. So he was born in 37 AD, that's what, four to seven years after the crucifixion. He studied in Rome. That's a little unusual for a Jewish man. He probably was very wealthy from a wealthy family. And he took, a, he took an attitude towards Rome that was very unusual for his people, at least to be up, upright about it, uh, upfront about it. He was impressed by the power of Rome. He actually was biased towards Rome and thinks that Rome was supposed to be ruling over Israel. Now, that didn't make him very um, popular among his people. Josephus comes back to Jerusalem in the early 60s. Who's the emperor of Rome in the early 60s AD? Just shout it out. Yes, good job. Good students in here. Nero was the emperor. And I think we moved there now to Nero. He, um, Josephus, Nero had brutalized People. He was the first of the emperors that really started to persecute both Jews and Christians. And um, he had, uh, his brutality had led 
to an uprising, or was about to lead to an uprising. Josephus comes back to Jerusalem just before that happens, and he's alarmed by the uproar and the talk of revolt. He believes that Rome should rule, and so he tries to avert the violence and the terrible things he knows will happen to his people. Well, there was a Roman general under Nero called Vespasian, and he was sent to Jerusalem then to put this revolt down, and he laid siege to the city. In the process of that, he captured Josephus, Uh, and Josephus... um, was a pretty clever guy, and he managed to get on Vespasian's best side by prophesying over him that he would become the emperor. Now, is this because Josephus was politically astute and looked around and saw that Nero was really unstable and he was going to die and Vespasian had, was a powerful man? I don't know uh, if it was uh, just a, a clever statement, you know, kind of putting a, a little bit of risk out there on the line or if he heard this prophecy from God. Well, maybe, I don't know if we'll find that out in heaven or not, but um, he foretold that Vespasian would become emperor, and it happened one year later, okay? So Vespasian was pretty impressed by this guy, and he made him a part of his court. What does it mean when someone is a part of the court of of a Roman emperor? What does that mean? You sit around looking pretty? He's an advisor. Yes, he's a counselor. And so he would have given uh, counsel to Vespasian about the Jewish people. Well, because Vespasian became emperor, he had to put someone else in charge of the siege of Jerusalem, which was going on for a while. And that was his son, Titus, which was no relation to the Titus in the Bible. And Josephus became an interpreter for Titus. He would trot back and forth between the, the, the armies and the Jewish leaders and try to help broker peace and get the leaders, basically the Jews, to give up. But the Jews considered him a traitor, refused to listen when he urged them to surrender. And so in 70 AD, we have basically the beginning and end of the first Jewish war. After a long siege, during which many people died, Um, Titus captured and destroyed Jerusalem. The temple was burned to the ground. That temple, that's the second temple, the one built by Herod the Great. He had long since died, but the temple was finished in 64, destroyed in 70. Has never been rebuilt since then. So many Jewish people died. It was a terrible, terrible time. Okay, so that's the history he fits into, Josephus. And now let's talk about what he thought about prophets. Josephus had a mixed relationship to prophets. There's two kinds, uh, more or less. There's oracle prophets who speak out a prophecy that might predict the future or might just be God's statement about a situation. And that's what Josephus did, right? He was an oracle prophet. He spoke an oracle over Vespasian that ended up coming true. But then there's the sign prophets. Now, these are um, very particularly people of the first century. I don't know if if we could give that name to other later, uh, you know, things, movements that started. I think this is very particular to this time. They have a messianic style, and they start movements. Now, you can see why Rome would not like this, right? And... Since it was bad for Rome, Josephus didn't like it either. He doesn't like sign prophets. They base their identity on inter- the tr- interpretations of scripture of the current time. So we're look- going to think about how people in the first century would read these scriptures and understand them. And I've got people ready to come up and read. We're going to start with Genesis 49. Um, just listen. To, think about being a first century Jew in uh, under Rome, not free, right? You, you, your own people are captive people. Sorry, Genesis forty nine ten. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, 
and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. But look at us. We've been a captive people under various world powers for all these years. There was that time in 160 BC when the Maccabees took back the land and they ruled for 100 years. And then in 60, I'm rounding the numbers off, in 60 BC, so less than 100 years from the time that, of Jesus, right? Um, the Maccabees capitulated to Rome, basically stupidly. You know, they, they had taken over all of Palestine and they just invited Pompey to come down and solve a quarrel between two brothers and he just took over. That was really stupid. But um, that was the closest that they had come to seeing a fulfillment of a word like that. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. And serious reading of their scripture was leading to an expectation among many Jews, not all, many Jews, that some kind of Jewish ruler would arise again and take back the land again. So here's another one in Numbers 24. A similar expectation is often linked to the Genesis text. I <clears throat> excuse me. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. So there's that scepter arising again, and there's a star, which is something uh, Christians now look back at and see fulfilled at, in Bethlehem. And Matthew makes a big deal out of that. Matthew also is writing to to a Jewish audience, just like John is. Um, so they're believing that a military ruler would arise and that people would follow him to fight for God and restore their kingdom. Josephus, strangely enough, links this to Vespasian. So now let's move to the end of the Torah. Remember what the Torah is? The five, five books of Moses, right? So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So we'll move to the end of the Torah um, for information that gave specificity to the Jewish expectation of a return of their kingdom under a messianic leader. Moses has brought the people to the verge of entering the promised land. And Deuteronomy contains God's instructions to the people for this new life they were about to begin. And if you want to hear really good teaching on this, look in some of the archives from Sojourn, where Craig is preaching on these books. But uh, here's God's getting them ready for their new life in the promised land. Also some warnings and some predictions, right? So first of all, we'll start with Deuteronomy 18. And I can just come over here, actually, and you can read right there. Uh, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites, you must listen to him, for this is what you asked the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire any more, or we will die. The Lord said to me, what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. God promised another prophet like Moses. Now, some people see at least a partial fulfillment of, you know, of that in Joshua. But at this point in history, they're looking back and saying, where is the prophet like Moses? Where is the prophet? And they're looking for someone now think about what Moses did. He went before Pharaoh, and he showed signs, right? And eventually those signs convinced Pharaoh to let the people go. And so the result was that they were released from captivity. In, in Deuteronomy, put your glasses back on, 29, Moses says, um, you're not going to do this very well. Now Moses called all Israel and said to them, 
You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, the great trials which your eyes have seen, the signs and okay, the signs and those wonders. Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear, to hear to this very day. So Moses referring back to those signs is saying, you all, you're going to forget. You're going to apostatize is the name for turning away from God. Um, he, he, he says, he speaks of the signs negatively as something that did not convince them, God's people. They sort of, the signs sort of convinced Pharaoh. He kept repenting from it. But um, here, even though they saw the signs... Even though they have experienced all kinds of wonders in the meantime in the desert, those all could be seen as signs, they're going to break the covenant. Now, Moses also gives them hope, um, and this is 10 verses long. Who did I give that one to? Oh, it's over here. Ty's got it. Um, so uh, this is a, bit, a little bit long, but it's a really beautiful prediction of what will happen. Think of yourself as a first century Jew reading this and thinking, it hasn't happened. Okay. When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come upon you, and you take them to heart, wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, and when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul, according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you from all the nations where he scattered you. Even if you have been banished to the most distant lands under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your fathers, and you will take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants, so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. The Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies who hate and persecute you. You will again obey the Lord and follow all his commands I am giving you today. Then the Lord your God will make you the most prosperous in all the work of your hands, and in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock, and the crops of your land. The Lord will again delight in you and will make you prosperous, just as he delighted in your fathers. If you obey the Lord your God and keep his commands and decrees that are written in the book of the law, and turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. That's just full of covenant language, isn't it? Um, first century Jew says, well, this hasn't happened yet. We thought it was happening in the, under the Maccabees, and Jonathan Maccabees and Simon Maccabees were both uh, thought by some to be the Messiah, they, and they connected both the priesthood and the, the royalty in one person, which was also a, a little strange because the priesthood is supposed to come not through the royal line, but through the line of Aaron, right? So all that just slightly asides, but it, it hadn't worked out. We now look at this prophecy and think about 1947 when Israel returned to the land. But of course, the full fulfillment of that is not even in that. Um, so Moses predicts that they will return to the Lord, and he describes how it will be. But now in the first century... Israel has gone through these cycles of apostasy and restoration, apostasy and restoration. Finally, God gets to the end of his patience and lets them go into exile. And then they have this ongoing captivity under various world powers and a false hope of a restored kingdom under the Maccabees and then the Romans. The kingdom has never been restored to its former glory some Jews began to believe that now was the time, right? So the first century was a ripe time in the hearts of the Jews. It was also a ripe time in the hearts of the Gentiles, but that's a story for a different day. They thought they were going to be seeing a prophet like Moses arise uh, who would show signs so that they would know he was the right guy, and they would, he would be a military leader who would clobber the Romans, right? And they would take back their land again. And sure enough, because this expectation is there, 
a series of sign prophets arises in the hundred years, kind of starting from the time of Jesus and, and going forward. There may have been some before Jesus, but Josephus doesn't report on them, and he's our only source, so we don't know that. I'm going to show you three examples of sign prophets who were reported by Josephus. And notice that the first one comes right after Jesus. And I want you to pay attention to the importance that they place on the showing of a sign by the prophet. So we start with the Samaritan incident. This is the one that cost Pilate his job. 36, so this is just a few years after Pilate had put down that prophet, Jesus, right? Now, for a background, I'm going to have Lucien move ahead one, and you'll see a map that I'm going to use for the other one. But right now, you see where Judea is and where Samaria are, is, right? Um, so how, how they are in relationship to each other. Samaria is north of Judea. The capital of Judea, of course, is Jerusalem. The capital of Samaria is Samaria, the city. And if you see it there, the, there was in Samaria a mountain to the southeast of the city of Samaria. And now you can go back. Um, this is the view from the top, or almost the top of that mountain. It's called Mount Gerizim. Now the Samaritans had, um, you, I'm sure you're aware of this, they had intermarried, so their faith, uh, what, their religion was not pure. It was mixed with that of the pagan peoples, and they had intermarried with them. And, um, but at the same time, they also had the Torah, the five books of Moses. It's called the Samaritan Pentateuch. It's, it's more or less has survived uh, to today, and we know w what it says. And it's pretty, almost the same as the Jewish Pentateuch. There's a few differences. But they had the same verses that we just read, right? So their expectation of a coming Messiah, who they call Tahib for some reason, is, uh, is the same. They're expecting a prophet to arise. So one of the very first sign prophets was a Samaritan guy, right? And he said, okay, y'all follow me out into the desert, and then I'm going to lead you up onto Mount Gerizim. And when we get to the top of the mountain, I'm going to show you where the utens... Oh, oh, big, important, missing piece of information here. Their temple had been, they built a temple on Mount Gerizim, doing, okay, they built a temple on Mount Gerizim just like the Jews built one on Mount Zion. But during the Maccabees, the Maccabees wanted to centralize worship of Yahweh only in Jerusalem, so they had gone up to Samaria and they had destroyed the Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim. Okay, now we're all caught up. Okay, now we've got a Samaritan prophet who says, their, their temple's been destroyed, right? He says, follow me up on the mountain, and I'm going to show you the utensils of our worship, which would probably have had to do with the sacrificial system. They're buried there on the mountain, he promised. And that would be his sign. He would be demonstrating to them that he was that prophet like Moses, right? Pilate, just a few years after putting down that prophet Jesus, heard of it. He sent out his cavalry, and he attacked these people before they got to the mountain, before the sign could be revealed. He killed the prophet. He killed many other people. And because of his brutality with this, the Samaritans appealed to Rome, which was then under Emperor Tiberius, and Pilate was deposed. He lost his job over this. Now, a very interesting to notice is that Caiaphas lost his job shortly after. Who is Caiaphas? The high priest. Because during the trial of Jesus, Caiaphas and Pilate had kind of become buddies. And you stroke my back, I'll stroke your back. And when Pilate lost his job, then Caiaphas was so closely connected to him that he lost his job too. Okay, we move on to Thudas. So that's one sign probably. Here's another one. Thudas was a sign prophet who urged people to take along their possessions and follow him into the wilderness. So he's out in the wilderness to the uh, right, so the, the east of the Jordan River, which runs between the two bodies of water there. He's over there, and he said, we're going to walk to the Jordan River. I'm going to step in the water, and the water's going to part, and we're going to walk across dry shod. 
that's his sign. Well, of course, what's he playing off of? Everyone always says Moses first, and surely that could be part of it, uh, the, leading the people into, into their, the promised land. Uh, but who's the bigger one? Joshua, exactly. Everybody thinks of that after I say Moses is wrong. And <laughs> so, so Joshua stepped into the Jordan River, and it parted just like Moses parted the, the Red Sea, right? And the people went across. Now, there's a picture of the Jordan River, and I've always thought, whoa, big deal. They could have waded across that, like just get their feet wet. But um, I actually uh, followed up on that uh, question yesterday for the very first time, and I found out that the Jordan River as it is today is about 2% of the size that it was in biblical times. So now multiply that a few times, and you'll see that it was a significant thing to cross the Jordan River on dry land. Um, now, here's the point. What happened when Joshua crossed the river with his armies? After that, after he crossed the river, what did they do? They took the land. So what is he promising? A reconquest of the land. If this prophet can part the waters, the military will rise, the Jewish military will rise up and they will uh, fight against Rome. That will be the sign, right? So Governor Fadus was the governor at the time under Claudius. He didn't wait to see if the prophet could part the water. He sent his troops out and intercepted them in the wilderness. He killed Thudas. He killed a whole bunch of the others. And the Romans cut his head off and took it around Jerusalem and then hung it up at the temple gate. Did you know Thudas is in the Bible? It's in Acts. Have a look. Everybody look. Now, I'm going to skip around a little bit. That's why I'm reading this one. But here we've got um, the apostles are in trouble, as often happens. And... They have been brought before the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish council. Jesus was before the Sanhedrin before he went before Pilate. And um, they're mad at him. They're, you know, they're saying, you should not preach in the name of Jesus. Uh, yet, 28, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you're determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. And Peter says, well, we have to obey God rather than men. And they get really mad. He goes on to say some more things that make them really mad. So they want to put them to death. And a Pharisee, verse 34, named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put aside for a little while. Put them in the other room. And then he said, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago... Thudas appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. And then he names another sign prophet, who I'm not going to talk about today, but he's in Josephus. So this is double um, confirmation of the existence of these guys, right? Uh, so after him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. And he too was killed and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of, from God, you will not be able to stop these men, and you will only find yourselves fighting against God. So that convinces them. They, have, they bring them back in, beat them up, and tell them not to preach in Jesus' name, and then they go out preaching in Jesus' name. <laughs> okay. What was Gamaliel's strategy here? Let the Romans do the dirty work. Let the blood be on their hands. They're really good at killing sign prophets. Let them take care of these guys too, right? Because they've already seen multiple sign prophets be killed by the Romans. All right, so they'll, let them take care of this. So last one is an Egyptian guy who was never named, a Jewish Egyptian, 
Um, he led a large following from the wilderness onto the Mount of Olives. Now, there's some really interesting, first of all, the wilderness tradition with these prophets, they're, they're, they're com connecting with Moses through that. And the Mount of Olives was said to be where the Messiah would first appear. And a lot of people tried to have their graves on Mount, the Mount of Olives so they could be the first ones to rise from the dead, right? Because the Messiah would come there. So this is standing on the Mount of Olives, looking out over the Temple Mount, uh, except that it's gone now. So the temple is not there, but the, uh, t uh, what's it called? Dome on the Rock, the Muslim shrine, is there now. So he led a large following from the wilderness onto the Mount of Olives. They're looking over the temple site. At this point, Jerusalem is under control of the Romans. So he says, I'm going to command the walls to fall down so, the, so his followers could enter and retake the city. Now, there's a, there's a number of things he's playing off of here. First, he has come from Egypt, like Moses, right? The walls falling down reminds you of Jericho, right? And he's on the Mount of Olives, where the Messiah is supposed to come, right? So... Um, Oh, if you wanted to look more about why they think Mount of Olives, look at Zechariah 14, chapter 14, but we won't take time for that today. So the Romans now under Felix, this is early in the reign of Nero, they respond, they attack, they kill a lot of the followers, but the prophet gets away this time. And now we think this might be who's referred to in Acts 21, so we're going to look at that. This is later now. This is 56. Um, there's a little bit of question about whether this is the guy, but uh, it could be. So in Acts 21, Paul is in trouble, and he's really good at getting in trouble. And he has caused an uprising in Jerusalem. And the commander of the barracks is trying to figure out what's wrong here. And and everybody's shouting, and they want, they want to kill Paul. And... So he thinks, well, he's got some kind of a criminal here, and he takes Paul, and he's starting to take him into the barracks. And uh, let's see, I lost my place here. Okay, Paul says, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? Now wait, am I in the right place? Oh, no, I'm in the wrong chapter. That's an, that adds interesting aspects to this. Okay. The soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, verse 37, and he asked the commander, can I say something to you? And the commander's like, what? You speak Greek? Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the desert some time ago? And Paul goes on to say, no, I'm a Jew, Jew a Roman citizen, and so on. Um, what I don't understand is why he was surprised that he spoke Greek, because Every citizen of Rome spoke Greek in those days, but maybe it was about the accent or something that the commander is noticing Paul's accent. He knows he's not that Egyptian guy that he thought he was, which would have been probably this guy. So Josephus says there were many such prophets. They offered signs in the wilderness, is how he describes them. They offered signs in the wilderness. That's that Exodus tradition. The, long after the death of Josephus, the last one of these was in 135, Simon Bar Kochba. Bar Kochba means son of a star, so he was pointing to that numbers passage, right? And he led an uprising where a half a million Jews were killed, and Hadrian, the emperor, made Jerusalem into a Roman city, and Israel ceased to exist until 1947. Right, so um, the Romans repeatedly put these things down before the prophet could perform the miracle, perform the miracle. They were not skeptics. They really believed in the possibility of these signs occurring. They may have feared that Jesus would end up leading a rebellion and treated him pretty much like they treated all the sign prophets. Now, what I'd like us to look at now is we're leading into, okay, what does this mean for John, 
because that's what we're talking about here. First, just the, the New Testament attitudes towards the signed prophets. And I'm going to read these again because I'll skip around again. But you should look. Matthew 24. I'm turning there too, so you have just as much time as I do. Matthew 24. Now, a lot of times we read this as end times uh, prophecy by Jesus. And there, there may be a mixture here, just like the Revelation is a mixture of things applying to the first century and things applying to the end times. But just now, with all the information I just gave you this morning, think about what, I, what it says here. Jesus left the temple and was walking away, and his disciples are going, look at all the, you know, because the temple's still being renovated at this time under Herod, right? Look at all these beautiful buildings. And Jesus says very sarcastically, do you see all these things? I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. He's predicting the destruction of the temple that happens in 70. Right now, they, Matthew knows that by the time he's writing this, probably, but the disciples at that time don't know. And what do they think he just did? He just offered a sign, right? Then Jesus goes on the Mount of Olives, and they come up to him privately. Tell us, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answers, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. Now we have to skip forward because we can't read the whole thing. I think it's verse 10. Yep. At that time, Jesus continues, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear, false prophets, and deceive many people. Look at verse 23. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I have told you ahead of time. So if anyone says, there he is, out in the desert, don't go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms, don't believe it. Right? And, he, and he's going on then to talk about the signs of the times. The demand for a sign from Jesus this, this shows you why he refused to give a sign. When the Jewish leaders said, for example, he talks about the destruction of the temple one other time, and they say, what sign do you show us that you do these things or say these things? Right? They're asking him to give a sign. What are they actually doing? They're trying to get him in trouble by getting him to promise a sign. It's entrapment, right? The ruling Jews wanted Jesus to be included in this category of sign prophet. Jesus walked this narrow line, very dangerous. He called himself a prophet. He fed 5,000 people in the wilderness. If that's not a sign, right? But he pro refused to promise a sign. That was the thing, the sort of promising ahead of time. And, and like I said, Pilate probably crucified Jesus as a potential sign prophet. So that's in the 30s as this movement is up and running. In the 50s, smack in the middle of it, Paul, writing to the, the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians, um, he's more interested in the problems of the Greeks, but he mentions the Jews here. The Jews require signs, he says. Now, he's, he's talking about uh, the Messiah figure here. Jews require signs. Greeks don't care about the Messiah. They prefer wisdom. But we, Christians, we cr proclaim a crucified Messiah. We always say that we proclaim Christ crucified, and that is the same words, but we've, we've domesticated those words. We don't think about what it means. They're looking for their Messiah, their prophet like Moses, and he's going to be a military leader, and he's going to ra raise up an army, and they're going to defeat the Romans. And Paul says, we proclaim a Messiah but he's a crucified Messiah, right? A, a crucified Messiah, and that is a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. 
So this stumbling block to the Jews part is going to be important for John, who's writing in the 90s, right? He, uh, and this isn't the end of the sign prophet movement, but he seems plenty comfortable now in using the word signs. The three synoptic gospels have dozens of miracles of Jesus, and they just randomly talk about miracles that Jesus does all over the place, and mostly show them as signs of his compassion. John chooses seven, exactly seven signs and he miracles, and he calls them signs. After the wedding at Cana, he says, this was the beginning of the signs that Jesus did. Right? After, in chapter 4, he says, this was the second sign. Right? So John records seven signs. He's trying to say what? Who is Jesus? He's the promised one. He's the, the prophet like Moses who God had promised. Right? And he records the signs not to call people to arms, but to produce faith, right? So his purpose for recording the signs is different. So let's walk forward into the Gospel of John here for just a few minutes, because um, this will now, uh, you'll, you'll see this for the rest of the semester, how, how the sign prophet movement affects the way that John writes his Gospel. But there, there's a couple things I can point out right away this morning. There's several theories as to the authorship, and I'm just, you know, being very quickly now, I'm convinced that it either is directly written by the apostle himself very late in his life, or it is a curated collection of his sermons put together by one of his disciples. Either way, the title, according to John, that the early church gives this gospel is appropriate. Now, the more important is the audience. Whoever John is, he's writing to a troubled, embattled church. We read the Gospel of John like this nice document. These are, this is a, a battle for the very souls of these people. The Jews are still looking for their prophet. The Romans are so tired of these rebellions. In the 90s, Domitian is the emperor, and he's the first of the emperors to require that people worship him. Well, any conquered people has some safety uh, because they, they have an agreement with Rome. The Jews do, for example. They have an agreement with Rome that, that they can worship their own god. Right? But Christians are not an ethnic group. Christians are all different ethnic groups. They don't have any protection at all. And now I enter into the realm of speculation, but here's what I think is happening. I think we have the audience of the Gospel of John is a, is a somewhat isolated place. It's not Ephesus, as the tradition often says, where a Jewish synagogue has existed alongside of Messianic Jewish church. Their, their family, their, their brothers and sisters and fathers and daughters, and every, you know, they're related to each other for two generations. We're in the 90s now. And, and they have been friends. They've disagreed on the, whether J Jesus is the Messiah, but they've allowed the Christians to coexist alongside of the synagogue. Now Domitian is demanding worship from everyone, but the Jews are a little safer. The Christians are being threatened with excommunication from the synagogue, because the synagogue doesn't want to have anything to do with them anymore, because they are dangerous, and the Christians are having a crisis of identity and faith, and thinking about going back into the synagogue and denying Jesus. That's the big deal. That's what John is writing to prevent, to stop them from doing that. And the whole gospel is about this. Now we'll look at just a couple of things. First of all, evidence for the excommunication uh, is those verses there. And, uh, you can go back and get this off of the video later. I'm sorry, you guys, you don't get to read because our time is running out. But um, you'll see that in each of those verses, somebody's getting kicked out of the synagogue. 
John is the only person to record those incidences because they matter to his church. Right? They didn't matter to Matthew, Luke, and, and Mark because they weren't going through that. So this affects the purpose of the gospel. Now we have a very quick look at the structure of the gospel. And again, this could come up more on Wednesday nights. Prologue and epilogue are just one chapter long or even shorter. But in the middle, the main part of the book is the, is the two books, the book of signs where he shows the seven miracles and the book of glory, which is about the death of Jesus. Half of the gospel is about the death of Jesus, right? And why is it called the book of glory? Really quick, it's because John sees the cross as a station on the way. Jesus comes from the glory with the Father. He's God, right? He's coming from the glory that he has with the Father and his ministry, and then the cross is a station on the way back to the glory that he has with the Father, right? So that's a really short in explanation of that. But what we're interested in right now is the book of signs. Seven signs. Uh, like we said, he's, all, he's saying Jesus is, he's the one. He's the prophet. And, he, and even though he's not a military leader, he is the one who, in whom you must put your trust. The prologue makes something else clear that nobody expected, and that is that this prophet like Moses, this suffering servant, this Messiah, this king of Israel, is God himself. Nobody thought God was going to come and be a person and be incarnate. We, we talked about John 1.14 last week. This is the fulcrum verse of all human history. And the word became flesh and tented among us, and we beheld his glory. God becoming flesh was expected by nobody. And, and that's what he, why, one of the reasons why Jesus was not recognized by the Jews. But we'll, oh, oh I want to go off on that some more, but we won't. Okay. The one other thing that I want to focus on is you, you could go ahead to the I am statements, Lou Shane. I think... You might have to skip one. Nope, it's right there. And I won't talk a lot about them except to say the purpose of them. The I am statements we read as very beautiful poetic statements of Jesus about himself, and they are. But when he says, before Abraham came to be, I am, he was claiming to be God because God is, right? So he describes himself like the name Yahweh as e eternally existent. And when he says... I am the bread of life, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am the resurrection, and the life, I am the good shepherd. All of those are, first of all, about life, that Jesus gives life. But I'd like you to notice something else that's going on there. They're about the exclusivity and superiority of Jesus. John is quoting these statements of Jesus because they make very clear that you can't go back to Judaism only Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through him. You can't say, okay, forget Jesus, go back to the synagogue. You can't do that. Only Jesus is the bread of life. Not Moses gave manna in the wilderness, and it wasn't Moses anyway. It was God who gave that manna. But Jesus is the bread himself. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. There is no way to God except through Jesus. Amen. You cannot turn your back on him and still be one of God's people. In chapter 12, John summarizes the signs ministry as essentially a failure. And I encourage you to read verses 37 to 43, but it basically says, in spite of such signs, they did not believe. And he has already predicted this in the prologue. He says, um, Jesus came into his own creation and his own people did not receive him. But there's a but there. And that's where I'm leaving us today, with the but. The, the, the refusal to accept Jesus is foreshadowed from the start of the gospel. Also look at 3.19 and following. John is wrestling with this. Why did, why did God's people not 
recognize their Messiah. But he, all through the gospel, he also points out that some of them did. Starting with the Samaritan woman, back to Samaria now, um, the, the man born blind in, in chapter 9, who his, even his parents kind of disown him, but, and he's in danger of being kicked out of the synagogue, and I think they actually do kick him out of the synagogue. There's that excommunication thing. Um, but he refuses to um, deny Jesus. He says, well, I, you know, I don't know. I can't tell you how I got my sight back, but I don't know anybody else who opens the eyes of the blind, right? I, I can't deny that he has healed me. Um, those who did receive him, those believing in his name, I'm practically quoting out of the prologue right now, he gave to them, so those who did believe, who did, remember Craig said a good translation for that word is trust rather than believe. Those who trusted him, who surrendered to him, he gave to them the authority to become children of God. Those are the ones who are born not out of sin, nor out of the will of the flesh, nor out of the will of a man, but out of God. And this uh, response to God of trust and surrender, this response to Jesus of trust and surrender, of belief, is opening the door then for all of us, as we, many of us, most of us have already gone through this door, to become children of God. And this will lead us very nicely into Craig's sermon next week from Nicodemus, I think it's next week, about being born again. What does it mean that we are born of God and that our trust has, has given us a new birthplace? And, and that's, just relate it quickly back to this, you've been born of God, you've changed your birthplace, you are no longer uh, from the Jewish people, you are no, now born directly from God, and you can't, you can't go back again. Right. Let's, let's just close our eyes for a minute and think about it. And I'll, in a second, I'll pray, but I'm just going to be quiet for a minute. Lord Jesus, I love teaching information about the Bible and facts about the history behind it. And I thank you that we had Josephus and he told us these things so that we understand the Gospel of John better. But now we want to move one step past that this morning and just um, those of us who have been born again, been born from you, we just want to take a moment and realize the significance of that, that we have chosen to follow the incarnate God, and that you have made us your children. And I would challenge anyone who's here today and wants to make that step uh, to come talk to me or to Keith or um, Natasha, some, someone who you noticed up front this morning, and say, how can, I, how can I make that step to being born from God? And so... We leave it there in each person's hands um, for the decisions that you're making this morning about your life. We pray to you, Lord. Amen.